Hey guys, this is Comic Uno in Comic Frontline, and today I'm doing Comic Uno episode 103, and this is a show where I review all the comics I read this week in one show, uh, so let's get started. We go worst pick of the week to best pick of the week, and what was worst pick of the week? Number 17. There's 17 comics today. I don't know if I mentioned that, uh, but number 17 is X-Men 92, issue 1. I think a lot of people are going to be shocked by that, because I was super excited to read X-Men 92. Um, I won't say I have a fandom towards the cartoon. I was born after the cartoon, so I obviously saw it in repeats, and I, I bought the DVDs when uh, I was younger. Uh, so I don't have a particular fandom to it. I'm more of an X-Men Evolution fan, but which is another rare thing to say. I, I think I'm in the minority with that one. But, you know, I like what I like. Um, but yeah, so X-Men 92... I really enjoyed the aspect of the characters. I thought they gave good homage to what the characters were in the cartoon and, you know, who the characters were at the time. The story, on the other hand, was kind of boring. Uh, you know, stuff we've seen before, it's, you know, about this woman who treats the bad mutants or, or pretending to treat them and actually captures the X-Men at the same time. That's what the story's about. Uh, but I thought the, the book was very busy. Uh, there was a lot of text. Uh, it just felt kind of boring. Again, it just felt very boring to me, uh, and it, it kind of, I had to trudge through reading it, which I don't want to feel that way with a comic, especially something I'm excited to read. So, uh, overall, I was just really disappointed with the series. I know a lot of people enjoyed this issue from what I've heard, but I just didn't really like it that much. So, I'll probably be skipping issue two, uh, and this was a big disappointment for me. So, X-Men 92 issue one gets two stars, and that's my number 17. Alright, moving on to number 16, which is Teen Titans, issue 9. Uh, you know, when this, I said this in my in-depth review, and I'm saying it here, when this book is good, it's great. When it's bad, it's really bad. And, uh... It's, it's not great here. Um, it's not a good, great issue. Uh, it kind of reverts back to things I don't like about the New 52 Teen Titans, where they just don't work together. They hardly interact with each other. Um, my favorite issue of this series was the Teen Titans Annual. I remember it made top five. It was a really good issue. I remember it made uh, Jay's top five also, um, and he's a big Teen Titans fan. Uh, but yeah, um, this issue just separates everyone again. And it's very much separating. It, the whole story is about separating the team. It's about uh, uh, Cassie. She doesn't like the idea of Superboy being around, and she wants to capture Superboy working with Star Labs, and then kind of the rest of the team saying, no, he's our friend. Let's, you know, work with him. Uh, so it's just literally separating the team, and the team doesn't even really talk to each other throughout the issue. Cassie's doing her thing, Robin's doing another thing, and the only people that interact with each other is Raven, Bunker, and... And, uh, and Beast Boy. Those are only three people that even interact in this whole series together and that you could call friends. And Raven's kind of hardly in that, in that segment, but I guess kind of is because they interact with each other the most. Uh, but yeah, that's the big disappointment with this book is that they're just not interacting enough. They're not acting as a team. I don't think the Teen Titans is even the right name for this book because half the time they're not a team. Uh, so yeah, and the artwork is okay. I don't know if it totally fits the story. I think this could be a better artwork in another series. I think it could be amazing artwork in another series. Just doesn't totally fit the Teen Titans. So, I was not impressed. Uh, you know, this was a kind of hard issue to get through. It, it was kind of boring all the way through. Uh, I just wasn't interested. But of course, I'll keep the series on my pull list because I'm a huge Teen Titans fan. I am, I am part of the fandom and, uh, I want to see what happens next, uh, and we'll see. So Teen Titans issue 9 gets uh, two and a half stars, and that's number 16. All right, moving on to number 15, which is a digital book, and that's Mulan Revelations issue 1, which I was actually really excited to read. It's a dark horse book. I was super excited to read this because I love Mulan. I love Disney, and I thought it would be in the vein of that, but it, it's not. Uh, the beginning, you know, talks about an ancient Mulan. Uh, and she's nothing like the one in the cartoon, uh, or the animated show, um, or animated, uh, movie, I'm sorry. And, you know, then it goes into a futuristic, uh, place. And they don't really describe anything about this character, uh, at all. It's very much about the surroundings of the issue. It's about, hey, we're in the past, now we're in the future. This is cool, right? Uh, there's nothing that really caught me at all um, in the issue. Uh, they just did not explain the character enough. They, she had a sister or a brother. I couldn't even tell with the artwork. But she has a, you know, a family member um, in the book. And uh, that's all we kind of know about her. We know that she likes to fight. 
I, that doesn't really give me much. It just did not give me enough. Uh, the artwork actually was pretty good. I loved the covering of the book. Uh, it gave that really cool futuristic style, but the story just was not there for me. So overall, um, I'm going to give this book a 2.5 stars, and that was number 15, and I probably won't get issue 2. I wasn't totally impressed. Alright, moving on to number 14, which is... Why do I have this? Howard the Duck, issue uh, four, uh, issue four. Uh, you know, I really enjoyed issue one of Howard the Duck. I thought it was a really, really interesting, solid book. Uh, it was close to top five, I remember, for that week. And I was just totally surprised by it, because I didn't expect anything from, How from Howard the Duck. And now we have this Doctor Strange story, which I really don't care about, because if you know me, I'm not a big Doctor Strange fan at all. Most of his stories, I just get so bored with it. I just not a magic fan, so I don't like Doctor Strange. So, you know, I think some of the, the jokes land um, with this book, and that's the fun thing of Howard the Duck. There's some really cool, you know, meta jokes here. Uh, very similar to to um, De uh, Deadpool. I like the supporting character, Tara. I really like her, but she's not utilized enough at all. Um, they created a great friendship in issue one, and then she just kind of tags along in the other issues, not really saying much in the issue. Uh, so overall, I, you know, the artwork was good. I really enjoyed the artwork of the book, even uh, when they actually showed the past. It looked really great, because they showed, like, kind of a, a Silver Age uh, version of uh, the Fantastic Four. Um, not, not even Silver Age, it was like the 1980s, sorry. Um, it was during Secret Wars. So, we get to see like a Secret Wars version, and I thought that was really cool the way they did the artwork. So the artwork really pressed me, and it kind of boosted the rating a bit more, but the story didn't. And I think I'm gonna drop Power of the Duck, um, even though I don't think it's a bad series. Especially with these comedy books, though, they tend not to go anywhere. Um, that's why I dropped, uh, Squirrel Girl and Rocket Raccoon. I dropped all those series because, yeah, they're funny, but they kind of get boring after a while. Uh, you know, it it really takes a lot for a comedy book for me to stick with a comedy book uh, because it's hard to balance story and comedy. Um, and Howard the Duck did it with issue one. I thought they did a great job with issue one, and now it's just kind of, you know, doing the same thing over and over again. So I'm going to debate. I, I think I'm going to drop Howard the Duck though, which is a shame because again, issue one was pretty good. So Howard the Duck issue four gets three stars for me. All right, moving on to number. We're up to number 13, which is a digital book, uh, which is Scarlet Couture, issue 3. Um, which has been an okay book. Issue 1 surprised me a lot. Um, the artwork is, oh, I wish I could show you the artwork, but the artwork is really good. I really like the cartooniness. Uh, it's very unique, and I really enjoy that. So that's something that's been making me stick with the series. But uh, the series is also very much about being a spy, which usually I like the espionage stuff, but I don't really like the plot that much. Like, I like the espionage stuff, even though I feel like they try too hard with it. Uh, they give a little bit too much lingo. Uh, but the actual plot and the actual mystery of the story, I think, is the part that falls flat. The character is actually interesting. Um, the main character, I will say. The other characters they could do a bit more with. But, you know, I think the book has a lot of potential, but it's almost over. And that's the, sh you know, the shame. Like, there, there are some really good parts about it. The artwork, the main character. Um, but they need to work on the plot. A lot, I think, they need to work on the plot. And I would say some of the espionage aspect of the book. But I will say the ending actually impressed me a lot. I um, really liked that she's underwater, and uh, she, she could be attacked by a shark, and uh, she's able to escape. So I thought that was kind of a good tension moment, and they need to do more of those. Because that's what, you know, espionage, the espionage genre is about, is that tension. And uh, the book kind of, like, throws in that lingo, but hasn't had that tension until that um, last kind of act in this issue. So overall, it's not a bad issue. I'll get the last issue for the miniseries, but it, it could have been a lot more than it is. So Scarlet Couture, issue three, gets three stars. All right, moving on to number 12, which is Ant-Man, Larger Than Life. Now, I got this book more as a safety measure, uh, which is weird. Uh, I got it, in which I'm going to explain what that means, but I got it because I thought this would have to do with Scott Lang. Um, I really didn't know what the book was about. I, I saw that there was going to be reprints. I'm like, oh, I don't know what to think about this book, but I was like, hey, it might have an original story where, you know, Cassie might be in it, and they might actually deal with stuff that were in the previous Ant-Man series, but that's totally not what this book is. Uh, it's actually about 
Hank Pym, and it's pretty generic, honestly. If you've never read Ant-Man in your life, pick this issue up. It's a very new reader-friendly book, and I'm sure that's the purpose of this book. Ant-Man is only a couple, of weeks uh, a couple of weeks away, and they probably just want those new readers to have a book to go back to, and, you know, uh, reviewers to recommend and say, oh, well, read this book if you've never read Ant-Man, because it describes everything about Hank Pym. And does not describe everything about Scott Lang. They might have a different version of Scott uh, for Scott Lang, but maybe that's what the, the actual Nick Spencer book is for. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty generic. It, it's um, it's Hank Pym playing with ants, and then you get to see uh, some reprints. Uh, that's that's what the issue is about. And you know, it wasn't bad. The actual story wasn't even that bad. Um, artwork was pretty good overall, but it's just a very generic issue. It's very new reader friendly. If you're a new reader, never heard of Batman, pick it up. But you know something about Ant-Man, you, you don't really need to pick this up, unless you want the reprints. Uh, so I think it's going to have a, a very small audience, but if you if you fall under that core, a category, go pick it up. Alright, moving on to number 11, I think we're up to. Yes, we are. We are up to number 11, which is The Flash, issue 41. <sighs> this book is improving a bit, but still, you know, not loving. It's one of those series also that, you know, I enjoyed The Flash enough that I don't want to give up on it, but at the same time, I, I haven't been enjoying the series for a long time uh, since Vendetti's kind of picked on it, or, you know, um, been uh, working on it. And this this story arc is a bit better than the last. The last one, you know, with Barry stuck in the Speed Force was really, really boring. <laughs> I did not really like the direction of that book. Uh, this is more interesting because we get to see... Uh, the return of Professor Zoom um, as Reverse Flash, which I don't know how that's working out because you had Daniel as Reverse Flash. So I don't know if they're just ignoring what happened in the New 52. We'll find out, but uh, we'll see where that goes. But the most interesting thing is uh, Barry's father kind of being this morally great character. He wants to help his son, you know, because he heard the name Thawne, and they have a connection. Uh, in the pre-New 52, they have a big connection. I don't know in the New 52 what they're going to do, but... Father does not like the name, so he escapes from prison and actually doesn't mind that someone dies. Uh, that way he could go kind of save his son. So this is very much a different version of Barry Allen's father than you might see in, like, the television show. Uh, so I think that's a really interesting aspect. So as concepts are interesting, but the actual issue kind of trudged through. Um, there's a lot of boring parts. The pacing's not great. Um... There's a lot of clutter with the artwork. There's a lot going on. I, I feel like I'm saying that a lot, but it's true. There's just a lot going on with the artwork. Uh, but yeah, overall, it, it's a bit better than what we've been getting, but at the same time, it just needs to work a bit more uh, to really catch my interest for The Flash. But of course, I'll keep it on my pull list, see where it goes. Uh, it is an interesting enough cliffhanger. Um, it has a bit more potential. So Flash issue 41 gets three stars. A lot of three star books this week. Alright, moving on to number, let's see, we are up to number 10, which is Planet Hulk, issue 2. Uh, yeah, a lot higher than it was that first issue. First issue did not impress me at all, uh, because it was mostly about Captain America, and I'm not a big Captain America fan at all. And when I pick up a book called Planet Hulk, I'm expecting some Hulk. And uh, with issue 2, you actually get some Doc Green, so we're getting closer to Hulk. Uh, so, this issue is pretty much about Doc Green and Captain America teaming up uh, in in this Hulk land. Uh, in, I, I don't know what they actually call the Hulk land. I think they just call it the, the Gamma Green something. They call it something. Uh, but, so, you know, it's a land full of gamma radiation, so... There's a lot of monsters look, uh, lurking around, and it's about Captain America wanting to find Bucky. Now, the part that I don't like about this issue still is the Captain America stuff. So I don't know if I'm going to get issue 3. I'm still, you know, I don't know if I'm going to get it. Cause it. For me, it's not an issue that I particularly loved. Um, but I do think it's an improvement, so that's why I was kind of more towards the middle of the list. It was an improvement, but still, like, I can't really sink my, eyes, um, sink my teeth into the series. So, Planet of Hulk issue 2... Again, better. So uh, I give it three and a half stars. The artwork was really good too. It was a good enough cliffhanger, but I just don't know if it gave me enough for me to get issue three. All right, so let's move on to number nine. Yeah, number nine, which is the Infinity Gauntlet issue two. 
Uh, so yeah, with this issue, I, I enjoyed issue one, um, but the complaint I had with issue one was the artwork, um, and I still have a complaint with that. There's a lot of white space, which uh, if they, you know, changed that with color, I think it would be a bit better. So it's definitely a unique art style, and that's something I don't love about the book. Um, and also there's a lot more action in this issue than the first issue. I personally like more story uh, than, you know, an issue filled with action, but I think they balance enough the action in the story here. Uh, it's mostly about the, the the mother Nova coming back and training her family to become Novas and then learning that her daughter found the affinity gem and uh, you know that that battle starting and people having affinity gems not just them you know Thanos has one and now we know that the Guardians has one too so the story is getting very interesting I think the plot is definitely stirring which I enjoy and you know the family interaction was good too again the only reason that it's a 3.5 book and a bit lower is because the artwork is a bit harder to get used to but the story has a lot of potential and I, I think it's definitely one of the more original books that uh, that's coming out for Secret Wars so Infinity Gauntlet issue 2 gets uh, three and a half stars for me now it's number nine so moving on to number eight, which is Deathstroke, issue seven. I'm glad to see this a bit higher, but I will say I like the finale of Deathstroke a bit better, uh, the finale arc a bit better. And it's been a while since we've read a lot of the DC books because we had that hiatus with Convergence. Uh, you know, the part I love the most with this book is the part I love the most with the, the last arc, and that's Rose. Rose's, uh, you know, relationship with her father, um, and that family dynamic, which I hope they add more of, because that's the that's thing I really enjoy about this book. Uh, but once again, um, I think Tony S. Daniel has wonderful artwork. I mean, this is some of the best artwork in an ongoing book right now. It's wonderful, beautiful artwork. And... You hopefully get one that doesn't have a Twix uh, ad. That way I can actually show you a whole full page. Uh, but yeah, just great artwork here. Really enjoy that. But the story itself, the actual plot, is the part I enjoy less of. Like, I enjoy the character moments. I like Slade himself, but the things he's going through is the part I don't really care about. You're like, he has this sword, he's gonna go against Wonder Woman. They kind of always throw a random hero in, or, or villain in the end. Like, I remember they had one with Harley Quinn, they're just like, oh, let's throw in Batman for no reason. It kind of feels the same way with this Wonder Woman uh, thing. It's just a, the actual plot needs to be a bit better. Like, I want to care about what Slade's actually doing, but the things I do like is the character moments between Rose, between Jericho, and Slade himself. I like his interior dialogue, but the plot needs to get a bit better. So, uh, Deathstroke issue 7, um, it's definitely getting there. I think it's getting better, uh, but it definitely has aspects I like about the book, um, but I want it I want it to be a bit stronger with the plot. So, Deathstroke issue 7 gets uh, three and a half stars. All right, moving on to number six, I mean number seven, which is We Are Robin, issue one. Uh, this book, you know, I think has a lot of potential. Uh, the artwork is a bit abstract. You have some longer lines for faces. So there's an example of that. Uh, and it mostly focuses on this one character, and you know, the book is called We Are Robin, so I expected a bit more of the Robin aspect, but it's learning a bit about his backstory, which I do think is necessary. Um, they might do this with all the characters, and I hope they do with all the characters. I don't want it just with this one character. Uh, and I hope we get to see a bit more of backgrounds with them, and uh, learn a bit more about them. And we see exactly why he wants to become a Robin, and at first, really not even connected to that. Uh, but his family is somewhere, he's trying to search for them uh, after Endgame because these characters are from Endgame. If you read one of the one-shots of Stephanie, I'm pretty sure it was, uh, they were looking for their family, and that's what this issue, um, I guess, it, what the series really span out of. But overall, it has potential. I wanted to see a bit more of the Robin-ness of the issue, but I, I like the character for the most part. Um, again, there wasn't a big oh-wow moment with the issue, but it has potential. It gave me enough for issue two. So We Are Robins, issue one, gets... Um, Three and a half stars. It has potential. I'll be getting issue two, but I do want a bit more of a wow moment with the series, which I think it does have potential to have. All right, moving on to number six, which is Daredevil issue 16. Um, yes, this was number six. Uh, and I like the issue for the most part. It's uh, Matt Murdock making a deal with the Kingpin to give his identity away. He's going to pretend that he's dead. He's like, oh, well, how's that going to happen? Mark Wade always makes a way because he's uh, telling... 
Uh, Kingpin, you know, use plastic surgery, make a new identity for him. Um, just that way Kingpin knows that uh, who Daredevil is and no one else does. That Kingpin has that power. But, um, of course, Foggy and Kristen does not know about this. And it seems that Kingpin might double-cross uh, Daredevil. And uh, that's, that's the whole issue. Now, the issue has wonderful artwork, as always. Really enjoyed that. Um, but I was actually a little nervous. I'm like, I don't want, you know, I hate the hero trope where they sacrifice themselves for their loved ones and they just keep their loved ones in, like, a little box and say, oh, well, you didn't really have a choice. I made the decision that you won't have me in your life. Um, so I hate that superhero trope. It, it seems like Mark Waid's playing with it. I hope he plays with it. I don't want it in the end where it's just like, I'm going to change my face. That way no one knows my identity again. It's like we played that game already. Just stop. Just make everyone know that he's Daredevil. That's fine. Uh, so I'm hoping they don't go that route. But I like what they did with Kingpin. I thought he was a very um, interesting villain here. Of course, he's always interesting. But they did him very well. And now that I've seen the Daredevil uh, show, it just makes me like Kingpin even more. Um, and I think they did that for a reason. Uh, but yeah, overall, it was a solid issue. Again, I, I do have maybe some potential problems with the issue. I hope that they don't... Um, they don't, uh, you know, they, they don't play that route with the trope, but I have tr trust with Mark Wade that they won't, and they might just, like, kind of, you know, make the audience second-guess themselves. So, good cliffhanger, pretty good issue, solid issue. So, Daredevil, issue 16, gets four stars. Now it's number six. All right, moving on to number five, which is... Effigy issue six. Um, this is a book that I think more people should be reading. Um, I love the celebrity um, commentary that the book has, you know, I'm a sucker for that. And I think it does it really well, because with this issue, it's definitely a, a final issue for the arc, um, and there will obviously be more, but it's a final issue for the arc, where it seems like they discovered um, exactly what's going on uh, with the case. Uh, who killed who? It seems like they actually did this, and it seems like the end of the case. And uh, our main character um, seems more comfortable with her own skin. Uh, but by the end, you have this, like, religious uh, cult going against her, um, going against her and kidnaps the mother, and they have another case to solve with the detective. There's a bit more of a love interest there, uh, and also our, um, the best friend, Edie, um, getting more into the, the cop detective side of things, which is cool. I really like this last image here. Uh, it makes me excited for what's to come, and this, you know, this unlikely trio coming together. Uh, so yeah, overall, I thought this is a very solid issue. I, I, I don't know how much I love this whole religious cult thing. I, I'm still a bit confused with it, how they popped up and what the hell they're doing. Uh, but yeah, overall, the, the rest of the story was really good. Um, love the narration, um, with our main character, where she says, I, I wanted regular, regular therapy, not therapy where, you know, celebrity therapy, where they give you drugs and say, oh, well, that's it. Like, she wants to be a normal person, and she's more comfortable with her own skin now, and she just takes you on this journey of who she was and who she is now. Uh, and really like that. You see kind of the development. We've, you know, it's only been six issues, but how much this character has grown with this one case. Uh, so really enjoyed Effigy. I thought it was a, uh, a solid four-star book, um, it is, uh, number five on the list, and we'll see where this religious cult thing goes. I don't know what to think with that, but we'll see. All right, moving on to number four, and these are, you know, hard picks. These are all great books. So number four was Injustice, Gods Among Us, year four, issue four. Um, really, really good book. Uh, I really enjoyed this book because we get to see, um, there is a battle that, you know, they have to go against, uh, and they have to pick two warriors to go against each other. So Superman, of course, puts himself up and says, oh, you know, I'll do it. And Batman tricks everybody and says, I pick Wonder Woman against, uh, to go against Superman. And because of the laws of Themyscira and, you know, the god laws, it can happen. And uh, Wonder Woman has to go against Superman. Uh, and then also the team learns that um, Wonder Woman is the daughter of Zeus, and I love that moment. Uh, and there's also another moment that I love is Harley Quinn, because she's awesome in this series, where she's like, I'll, I'll volunteer as Tribune, and she just keeps making these Hunger Games references until the end of the issue, where she, the last line is, um, Wonder Woman, the girl on fire. Harley Quinn was MVP of this issue. She had maybe, like, four lines, but she was so funny, and... I mean, the, just the character moments here, you know, Wonder Woman loves Superman, we know this, um, in the Injustice world, and she has to beat Superman up, and Superman's like, hey, you know, I'll be easy on you, and she's like, I'm not, and she 
pretty much plucks uh, Superman's eyes out or, you know, makes him red because he's Superman. And she's, like, breaking every bone in Superman's body. I was like, whoa, that's such a great way to end this issue. Uh, so just a wonderful, again, character-driven issue. Another wonderful moment is with Lex and Clark, where Lex is actually friends with Clark. It feels bad, the things that Clark is going through. Um, so that was a great moment. And then Lex betraying Clark, even though he doesn't want to. It's Yes, it's, it's a very different Lex. He's, he has this loyalty to Clark, but at the same time, he knows that Clark is doing the wrong thing. So that was a great moment. There are just so many great moments in this issue. I would say I wanted a bit more Batgirl, because they introduced Batgirl, and like, oh, what are you doing there, Gouger? Why introduce her for one issue for doing nothing with her? Uh, but yeah, the artwork was beautiful. The story just had so many great character moments. Um, I just think Injustice Guys Among Us is just back on track. It's only $2.99 for a hell of a lot of story. Uh, pick up this issue. It's so well done. If you like character moments, again, Injustice Gods Among Us is just so much on track again. And I'm glad, because uh, year three was kind of, you know, wasn't as interesting. I wasn't, you know, wasn't into the magic stuff, but this, this is a great arc. Alright, so I gave uh, Injustice Guys Among Us four and a half stars. Alright, so what was number three? Number three was S.H.I.E.L.D. issue seven. Uh, this was another great issue. Um, what I said in my in-depth review, I still uh, stick with. You know, I think it's a very fine line with these kind of Marvel 616 stories and trying to bring in the television show at the same time. Like, you know, some of these characters already exist. They're different characters in the show. And I was really excited for this Daisy arc, but I was also like, what are they going to do here? Uh, and they just did it so well, where Daisy was Sky, but still Daisy of the 616. Um, they actually referenced Sky as her nickname. Uh, Coulson calls her Sky because she's always in space and on missions. But you can tell she's just very much Daisy's, uh, the character Daisy. But, you know, there's still that Coulson Sky relationship that we all know and love from the show. So I think they balanced it so well. And the artwork is beautiful. And the characters really look like they're, um, your television counterparts. Not as much Daisy. I, f I feel like they kept that a bit more towards um, the comic version. But you have um, Mr. Hyde that looks a, a lot like his character on the show. Uh, so really enjoy the artwork. Beautiful artwork. And just a great story. Great father-daughter relationship story where we get to see... Uh, you know, Skye has scars on her face and she blames her father and uh, she wants a cure and she gets it and, you know, you just you just see this relationship, this this crazy relationship uh, grow, but it's not a happy ending like it is in uh, in the show. It's definitely a different ending. But again, you also see that relationship between Coulson and, and Daisy too and I just think they, they really join these universes very well with this issue and I think that's a very hard task but Mark Waid did and I, I applaud him so well and I can't wait to see hopefully that same thing happen with Mockingbird because Mockingbird's an even more well-known character um, in the 616 but she does have a different type of character in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. so I would like to see how they mesh that um, with the next issue. So S.H.I.E.L.D. issue 7 uh, gets four and a half stars. Just a really really well done issue. Very surprised with it and uh, I think S.H.I.E.L.D. just keep, uh, keeps getting better and better as a series. Alright so number two now I will say number two and one was a hell of a hard um, pick because both these issues got five stars, um, and I don't give five stars out randomly, you know. It, it definitely has to be a perfect issue to get five stars. Um, it's honestly rare when I give a, a five-star book. So two issues this week got five stars, so they must be great books. Uh, so what made number two? Number two was Little Mermaid issue five. Damn, this was a good book. When I finished it, I was like... I think this will be pick of the week. And then there's another book I read. I'm like, oh my god, what do I pick? Uh, but yeah, Little Mermaid was so well done. And as you guys know, I'm a huge Little Mermaid fan of the Disney um, movie and just Mermaid fan in general. So, um, you know, this, this issue we get to see that Erica is finally comfortable with herself. She's a siren. And you get a wonderful image of her turning into a siren. This artwork for the series is just beautiful. Beautiful artwork. I love, love the artwork here. Um... Like, you show every page. It's just beautiful. Um, but, you know, Erica finally meets her father. She feels belonged. And the, the guy who captured her kills her father. But the father saves her, uh, takes the bullet for her, and now Erica is queen. And uh, she meets her mother. She's she's not happy, though. She's she she's queen. She You know, she defeated the guy that captured her. But she's like, this is not freedom, you know. I don't... 
I feel, yeah, you know, it's a different area, it's a different place, but I'm not free. So it just ends on this cliffhanger, I'm like, I need more Little Mermaid. Uh, it's such a great cliffhanger, the, the, the monologue was so well done. Again, the artwork, having the stance here, her getting the new trident, oh my god, such a good issue. Uh, and again, it was such a hard pick to, to pick this as number two, and in, in another week, this totally could have been pick of the week, but, um... Wonderful issue. Meredith Finch, this is her best issue ever. <laughs> it was just so well done. Uh, but yeah, pick it up. Little Mermaid issue 5. It, it's such a well done issue. If you are if you didn't read the miniseries, go get it. You know, tell Zenoscope you want more because I definitely want another miniseries from Mer Meredith Finch and this creative team. So go get it. Awesome book. Uh, Little Mermaid issue 5. 5 stars. So well done. So what beat out Little Mermaid? Uh, it's a book that I have, I guess... I mean, both these characters are <laughs> characters I love, uh, but this is a, a event I've been waiting for a very long time, so that's why I picked this as number one, and that was Batgirl issue 41. Uh, yeah, oh my god, I love this book. Uh, you know, this is a book I, I actually turned back pages where I had to reread it because I loved it so much. Uh, there's just so many great moments because in this issue, we finally get the interaction of Robert learning that her father is Batman, and... And, you know, what's so interesting about this is that James, you know, didn't want, you know, Jim Gordon didn't want to, um, didn't want to keep a secret from her, her, from his daughter. And Barbara just feels so guilty about that because she's been keeping this secret about being Batgirl for, I mean, how long is it? Five years, a decade. Uh, and she never told her father. So she's about to tell him. And he's like, well, I need, you know, capture all the vigilantes. That's my job. And she's like, oh, that's cool. Uh, so now the end of the issue, we, we get to see that Batman's against Batgirl. And uh, will Barbara tell her father that she's Batgirl? And what will he do? It's very much a Spider-Gwen moment, uh, once again. Uh, and then Livewire is the villain, who's just great. Um, I really like her as a villain. Even though we don't get to see her characterization that much, um, she, she definitely... She definitely uh, is introduced very well. Um, and it, even though, again, it's kind of the mystery towards character, because what what type of character will she be in the New Fifty Two? And she's connected to the Hook, uh, the Hook uh, story arc, which is interesting. And I mean, the artwork that Bar um, Babs Hard does for for this book is wonderful. Look at look at Livewire. It's so great. Um, love love this art. And also something I really enjoyed about this book is the Frankie and Babs relationship. I really like their friendship and um, how Frankie is helping Barbara um, fight crime. I think it's really cool. So it's a perfect issue for me. Uh, it, it's just everything I wanted. And I hope in the next issue, again, um, Jim Gordon finds out there that his daughter is Batgirl. Uh, that's the only hope. But it, it just had that cliffing where I'm like, oh my god, I need the next issue. And that's how you know you have a great issue. So yeah, it was really hard to pick between Little Mermaid and Batgirl girl but I think this is a moment I've been waiting for for a bit more uh so that's why I picked it as pick of the week so number uh number one pick of the week is Batgirl issue 41 great book and the top five had just some really really great books this week uh so hope you guys enjoyed this is comic you know uh let me know in the comments below what was your pick of the week and worst pick of the week and everything in between uh of course I'll have comic you know episode 104 next week Hope you guys enjoyed. This is Comic You Know. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter. Don't forget to like my Facebook page. Also, description below, there's links from my comic book, Like Father, Like Daughter. And don't forget to like the Facebook page of Like Father, Like Daughter. And uh, I'll see you guys later. Uh, and let me know your thoughts in the comments. See you guys. Bye.